Welcome to the final video in our immigration chapter. This one's about provinces and immigration. All kinds of stuff to say. We'll see you inside. Welcome to the last video for this chapter on immigration for Social Studies 9. Today we're going to be looking at how provinces influence immigration laws and policies. This one is a hard one to teach and I'm going to be upfront with telling you that on video it's probably going to be even harder. Uh, this one takes a lot of discussion I find in class. So as you're watching this video, uh, there's a few things I'll highlight but I cannot go into all the details as I would in class. Um, so I'm just going to allow you to do a lot of the heavy lifting here by looking at things and answering some of the questions as you go. Uh, if you study this video enough, you should be able to still get it. Um, but I find that, um, yeah, this one's hard enough in class trying to get it, uh, our heads around it correctly. And I just feel like a video is not the, always the perfect uh, avenue for it. However, knowing that, let's, let's continue on and see what we can do here. So uh, good luck and let's go through this. Now, you're going to see in this video there's a lot of charts and graphs and maps because to the, teach this one well, it's like you've got to understand it and see it. That's what makes this one difficult for video because I like to do a lot of pointing out in class and we ask questions and talk about it. So the first thing you're seeing here is immigrant category per province or territory. All right. And uh, what you're seeing is economic family and refugee. You'll notice that in all these provinces, uh, economic immigration is always the highest because, again, it's always the highest. Okay. You'll notice that some refugees and family class a little bit more or less, depending. Uh, here in Alberta, you can see we got a 68, 23, and 9. Overall, uh, 62, 25, and 13. We're pretty similar in Alberta. I mean, fairly similar. To what's going on through the rest of, of Canada um, for the most part you know some are much different I would say like uh, like take a look at Ontario uh, they have a lot more uh, family class and even refugees coming to Ontario which makes sense because it's got Toronto a lot of people going to Toronto they know when they think of Canada they think of Toronto when they think of Canada they don't automatically think of Edmonton or Calgary necessarily okay so that's one thing keep that in your head you'll have to maybe come back in the video and look at this slide uh, when you get a question in the future. This is where immigrate, immigrants have gone recently, 2011 to 2016. Um, you can see that uh, most of the immigrants are going to Ontario. Quite a big thwack of them go to Quebec. And then in this one anyway, Alberta's number three with 17.1% just after Quebec and British Columbia at number four. Uh, the things I've looked at before and I think we'll look at in the book uh, in class and stuff is that Alberta and British Columbia kind of swap for three and four. But uh, we, we're kind of depending on the years, depending on what's going on in the economy, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Alberta and British Columbia um, tend to be kind of almost like neck and neck. But it's usually Ontario is number one, Quebec number two, usually uh, from what I've seen anyway, which makes sense. A lot of uh, French speakers going here to Quebec and then a lot of people going to Ontario for lots of those reasons we've already spoken about. Now on page 188, you're going to see where immigrants settle in Canada. And um, here they only give three cities, Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. So in this case, Vancouver would be the third largest city, not necessarily the third largest province of immigrants coming to the third largest city. Toronto is always going to be number one, 39%, Montreal with 15, Vancouver with 14. That shows where they're going. That shows uh, the Toronto population and area for the video, not that necessary, but just the fact of, of its sheer growth and size. Uh, sometimes in class we pull up uh, the recent uh, Toronto population and, as well. But as you go through, I just want you to see where are people going? Where are they going and what are they doing? This doesn't say how many are going. This just says the kind of people going there. But this one shows a lot of people are going to British Columbia or Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec. This one shows much the same because Toronto, Montreal, and then Vancouver. Okay. So as you look at those three bits together, think of them as three sources on a test. And the question is asking you this then. That one objective of the Immigration and the Refugee Protection Act of 2002 is to share 
the economic benefits of immigration across all regions of Canada. Think of it this way. If we as a Canadian society benefit from immigration, whether that's culturally or whether it is economically, if we benefit, how well has Canada achieved that goal if we are to share the economic benefits? And this is just looking at economic benefits, but if we're to share those benefits, how well has Canada as a whole benefited when 39% of, the, of immigrants go to Toronto, 15 go to Montreal, 14 go to Vancouver, and most go to Ontario and Quebec? Does all of Canada benefit from that? Is none of it benefiting? And why might immigrants to Canada not choose to settle in Toronto, Montreal, or Vancouver? Why would they go somewhere else? Why might they choose other cities in Canada? Why might they choose to settle in rural areas? Now, this is important to bring up because in class, I'll ask this question or they'll, students will write it down. One of the answers for this last bit, someone usually says, well, maybe they're farmers. Maybe they want to live in rural areas because they're farmers. Some people might mention something like oil as well. If you're an oil worker, you're not in the middle of Edmonton or Toronto. You're usually out somewhere else. We think of Fort McMurray here in Alberta. I bring those up as answers, as possibilities, because of what we're going to see next, which is the Provincial Nomination Program. This is important for the notes then. Now what this is, the Provincial Nomination Program is, is a program that allows provinces to nominate a percentage of the immigrants to Canada. Now nominate is in quotes because of mobility rights. We can't force people to live anywhere in Canada. You can't tell an immigrant coming to Canada, you've got to live in Alberta. Okay, you have to do it. You, you can't do that. But what this does is allows us to try to try to like get as many people uh, from a certain percentage into our province or a different province or whatever for certain types of things. And this allows us to set up even immigration offices in other countries. So like instead of come to Canada, you might see an office that says come to Alberta. We'll help you arrive here in Alberta. So if you're a farmer in Holland and you want to start a farm, come to this office. We'll help you get settled in Alberta. It's not a Canadian immigration office. It's like an Alberta immigration office. We're allowed to do that to try to get a bunch of these immigrants to come to Alberta because they already know the industries. They might know farming. They might know cattle ranching. They might know oil. Um, you know, they, things like that. Okay. Now, of course, we can't require immigrants to stay in a particular location or be forced to move there, but we can try and we can nominate people to live and work in Alberta permanently. Now, this is uh, showing what dif different types of jobs are. And you can see where um, vacancies are arising. This is 2019. Lots of the stuff I have, as you know, is pre-COVID because COVID changed all these numbers quite quite a lot so it's it's still good to use pre-covid numbers because we uh covid turned everything weird but you'll notice like healthcare and social assistance we're missing a lot of people in in lots of these kind of areas and these are jobs in high demand over here so what it does is it allows provinces if they have certain expertise in some of these areas to try to get people to come to their province for those jobs like healthcare or uh, technical services or something like that, sales, you know, um, business, finance, social sciences, or education. Like um, sometimes Alberta recruits teachers to come to Alberta to teach uh, for um, French immersion, for instance, you know, stuff like that. Knowing where the job vacancies are helps provinces to pull in immigrants that they think are going to help fill those job vacancies, which we learned about many slides ago that the reason one of the main reasons we have of we have immigration in Canada is to help our workforce and our workforce is suffering. And so we need those immigrants and the provincial nomination program allows us to specifically pull people in. Unless you're Quebec, Quebec's got a little different thing. They've got this Canada Quebec Accord. This is a specific agreement with Quebec and they can nominate uh, people according to their population. So depending on the population of like French speakers and things like that, they can nominate a certain percentage of immigrants to come to Quebec based on that percentage. 
What this does is it requires immigrant children to attend French schools, and it seeks out immigrants whose first language is French. 75% of French-speaking immigrants in Canada go to Quebec. That makes sense. 75% of people that are immigrants that are French-speaking end up in Quebec. However, now this is where it gets tricky, and I'll show you another slide that maybe will help. More non-speaking immigrants settle in Quebec than francophone immigrants. Okay, So those immigrants that are coming to Canada that speak French, 75% of them end up in Quebec, 25% elsewhere in Canada. But that number is vastly outgunned by the people coming to Quebec that are not French speaking. There are way more non-French speaking immigrants coming to Quebec than French speaking, which means over time, right? If this is the population of French speakers in Quebec, you know, here's, here's year one, here's year 2000, okay? My, pardon my terrible growl. The speakers that are coming in that are non-French speaking are beating that. They're raising at a higher rate, which means we're getting more and more of a population in Quebec that can't speak French. Do you think the French are going to be worried about this? You bet they are. So one thing that the Canada-Quebec Accord might do is look at investment in immigrants. Look at how much Quebec invests per capita, that means per person, in settlement services for Canadian, uh, for new residents to Canada way more than every province. Quebec is trying to say, if you want to come to Quebec, we want you to come. We want you to come speaking French, and we will take care of you. We will really make sure that you settle here well. If you're going to come in as a French speaker to Canada, go to Quebec. You're going to get way better service than anywhere else. Okay? That's why Quebec's trying to do it. They're afraid of losing French. They're trying to get people in. Here's that same statistic that I just uh, showed you last slide, but in graph form. 75 French-speaking immigrants, 75% of French-speaking immigrants in Canada go to Quebec. Hope I shouldn't use, uh, there we go. These are going to Quebec. These are going somewhere else. Okay. That part should make sense. This part's always a little trickier. Overall, though, more non-French-speaking immigrants settle in Quebec than Francophone immigrants. So these are all non-French-speaking, and these are folks... These are non-French. Okay? And so they're getting a huge influx of people that can't speak French. That's worrisome to them. Of the speakers that are coming that are speaking French, in Quebec and elsewhere in Canada, a lot of them come from former uh, uh, Francophone countries, f places that France um, colonized, basically. And you'll notice that a lot of them are going to be coming from places in Africa. Yes, some from like Vietnam and Laos, uh, but a lot of African immigration. And just so that you're aware of that, right? That leads us to the thought that France is now worried, or not France, excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, that Quebec is worried about losing French culture, that even though if people are perhaps speaking French, they're not French, they're not from France, they might be from the Congo, or they might be from Mali, or something like that. And if they're coming there and they have a different culture, Quebec is worried about that. So you'll see things like the uh, hijab law and you'll see some other things like that that are trying to keep uh, Quebec kind of the way it was always. And that brings up lots of issues of racism and xenophobia, but they also want the French speakers and it, it just turns into a big thing. So as we finish this chapter, it's not an easy solution how provinces can get those immigrants there. It's not an easy fix. Quebec's got a whole different problem because they want to maintain that French language. We've got a different problem because we want certain industries here in Alberta. Um, for instance, like I've said, you know, the farming or the oil industry or things like that. Um, but Canada does allow us to make some specific things for our provinces in order to help guide people here 
uh, and hopefully, you know, get those immigrants to come and stay. All right. So who needs immigrants? Well, here's the last kind of thing to think about. According to this graph, who actually uh, needs immigrants? This is where immigrants are going. If we're to share equally in our prosperity, who needs them? Where do they actually uh, need to go? Okay. So with that, we're going to finish up our chapter. And as you finish, you should think, how well do our immigration laws and policies respond to immigration issues? Do they respond well? Do they respond not well? Are they somewhere in between? That's something for you to be able to answer. Thanks so much for watching these videos. Have a great day. Bye-bye.